this evening. He is a true pioneer and inspiration. The reputation of his work in sustainability precedes him. He spoke five years ago at the launch of the Planet Mark, and from that moment, the incredible support from him and partnership with the Eden Project has been invaluable to the Planet Mark. Please join me in welcoming Sir Tim Smith back again this year. <laughs> In 1972, I went to a rock gig in Rotterdam and I saw something which would change my life. I saw 15,000 people terrified by 10 Hells Angels. Think about it. It's absolutely extraordinary how very few people can intimidate an enormous amount of people if the enormous amount of people don't know that if you step forward, 10,000 others will join you. It's a really big thing and it's a really big thing in our society because while we, if you like, play around at the fringes of dealing with sustainability in a really polite and middle-class way, we talk about it in a beige, iterative way, well, a bit like moving the deck chairs on the Titanic, isn't it? A little bit. Does it not fear, doesn't it scare you just a little bit that we might all be playing around on those edges while the rest of the world actually bypasses us? I have this real fear, every, every, every time anybody ever says how well we're doing in Eden, my skin crawls. My skin crawls for a reason. Because if you want to know the truth, Eden is quite good. It's quite good. It's only that we get hugely overrated because everybody else is so crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being serious. I'm being serious. We, we live in an affirmative culture where, hey, well, you've done really, really well. It's kind of Americanism has gone mad. But actually, we're not doing really, really well. I want to describe something that happened to, you, to me last May. I was challenged by my youngest son. I was invited to talk uh, to, to climb the tallest tree in the world, the biggest tree in the world, in the Sierra Nevada mountains, next to uh, the Sequoia National Park. And I have a pathological fear of heights. I hate heights. I discovered something really, really deep about myself, that I have one fear even greater than height which is being thought a coward. <laughs> and when my son fixed me and said, would I do it? It's a once in a lifetime experience. I rather feared he might be right. And anyway, we, we flew to San Francisco, we went up to the Sierra Nevada, and I was dragged by two young men to the top of this tree. And it was a very extraordinary experience, as you'd expect. You look one way, and you look right away across Sequoia National Park, forever. It's like green forever. Although it isn't green forever because all the pines are dying. Hundreds of millions of pines are dying. But other than that, there's green forever. And then when you look to the left, you see Death Valley. It's biblical. There, you look, boing, 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 boing. Do you know what I thought? I don't know whether any of you ever climbed a really big tree, but what's really weird is when you're at the bottom of one of those sequoias, you've got the bark, which is really, really thick, so thick you can put your hand right and bury it like that in its creases. And as you get higher and higher and higher, maybe it's something to do with your fear, but everything suddenly starts to feel softer. It may be an equation to do with I'm still alive, therefore it feels all more soft. But when you get really up high, it's a bit like, you know the feathers on an eagle or an owl that become really delicate and fantastic just around the neck? The bark suddenly becomes like that, and you hold it, and then something hits you. That tree was 4,500 years old. I'm an archaeologist by training, and what I know as a fact already, and it's probably more, is that 37 civilizations that I could name for you had a beginning, a peak, and a collapse, 37 of them, in the time that that tree had been alive. Think about that for a moment, and be aware that every one of those civilizations had people like us in it. And we didn't stop things. Why? What is it that stopped people realizing what they were doing? I see it everywhere now, and I see it happening to me too. And I see it happening to many people I know in this audience. What happens is you get sucked like a sponge into the establishment. You're doing well, and you get stroked like a pussycat. 
and you become more and more beige. You can't help it because beige just sucks you in. And then you suddenly realize you can talk about sustainability a lot. And you can make all the right sounds, everybody else is doing it too, and they're all wearing suits in the right place, and you go to Buckingham Palace and pink, pink in the air, and you talk about sustainability and accountancy. Don't you hate accountants? <laughs> <laughs> My God, I hate accountants. <laughs> the people who know the cost of everything, but they don't know the cost of not doing things. <laughs> so, bearing in mind those 37 civilizations, where does it leave us? Just imagine, we are all, we are all psychotically hooked into a world where we just don't know when the point is to stay stop. Have any of you spoken to any bankers recently? Does any of you, have any of you met a banker this year who doesn't confess they knew what was happening in 2008? Isn't it amazing how post hoc rationalization makes us all realize the truth and feel as if we were grown up and knowledgeable? I say all this not to terrify you, but I just, I think part of the purpose of what Steve was saying earlier is about this thing about reasonableness and the way you do get sucked into reasonableness. Dave and I have spent a lot of time in China. In fact, we're off again next week. We're building three Eden pro projects in China. And when Steve stands up and says, we're going to lead the world, like bollocks are you leading the world? Do you know what the Chinese say to us? They laugh. How did you elect a bunch of politicians who enabled themselves to tell you that it wasn't worth creating a sustainable world because China and India were going to fuck it up anyway? <laughs> did you realize? I thought they were supposed to be commercial. Can you realize if you'd actually concentrated on being maximally sustainable, you'd have the biggest markets in the world? But no, the beige cancer overtook us, didn't it? Because we confused great business, great environmentally friendly business, and we allowed a lot of people to believe that it was lefty dweebs mm. who wanted that. We have got to become muscular and not allow ourselves to be defined by others as being other because we believe in sustainability. <laughs> we mustn't allow ourselves to be called left-wing, right-wing, any-wing at all. We have got to get away from allowing ourselves to be treated as if we were no better than just consumers because that is where the cancer really lies. We are better than being consumers. We are citizens. And if you are citizens, you have future generations you have to keep in mind. And if you've got future generations you've got to be in mind, are you prepared in a hundred years' time for them to look on us as if we were a bunch of tossers, no better than a bunch of pigs in a trough, not brave enough to do something? That is why, for me, Planet Mark is important. Because although it has begun with small steps, it is something around which we can cohere. It is something around which we can develop something better than just carbon metrics, because the world is more important than carbon metrics. That's what accountants have given us. It's actually about a moral compass. The biggest problem with capitalism, and I am a capitalist, is that we don't seem to realize that the rules of it were not handed down by God to Moses. We can change them. We can change them to take account of the environment. We have got to become more muscular. We have got to find some money to enable people to do some thinking, to provide alternatives to the way we're going. I've spoken so often this last year of private groups of people who are terrified. And they're terrified because they've all realized something very late in life, that they are dead. There is no they. The digital revolution has actually shown it up in all its glory. The flower has been poured all over the invisible man. There is no they. Governments have not got the ability to police anything anymore. The only police are us and the values that we espouse. That is why this is so important. Edmund Burke, the great commentary, once famously said, rules are for the guidance of the wise and the enslavement of the stupid. I place to you, I think Planet Mark has got to be about breaking the rules, having learnt them, and being far fiercer than just pass on the brochure. It's actually got to be, if you're a citizen, you have got to be moving in this direction. In China, the president of China says, if you heal the soil, you will heal your soul. They've planted more trees 
in the last three years each year than the rest of the world all put together. They are producing more solar panels than the rest of the world put together. Yes, they are creating solar, uh, coal power stations, but when you meet people of your age, I'm not talking about your age, you're too old, but this lot. <laughs> when you meet people of your age in China, new Taoism is taking over. The new Taoism, working with the grain of nature, is the big thing. There are thousands upon thousands of very successful businessmen who are believing in the new Taoism, the new power to demonstrate that China can conquer its destruction with a new rebirth. Mm. It's sacrificed for a purpose. We need to regenerate. We are a tired civilization. We're showing all the signs of decay, and we've got to pledge ourselves to regenerating the energy to genuinely lead. And we must criticize people who just spend all their time talking about senses of excellence and being leading edge, cutting edge, bleeding edge, thinking out of the box, thinking the unfucking thinkable. We've actually got to do that stuff and not just talk about it. So I will end by saying I am really proud that we've been involved with Steve from the beginning. He is a most charismatic and genuine person. And one of the reasons why we've stuck to Steve all this time has been he's been real about it, real. Mm. And we've got to be real about it, but we've got to become muscular because if we do not become muscular, we might just as much have been complicit in being climate change deniers as Steve Bannon. Think about it. The betrayal of inaction. Ouch. Anyway, on that uplifting, really funny speech. <laughs> yeah. I didn't go down well like Tommy Cooper, did it? Um, no, so I'm sorry, it's just I feel so strongly about it. There's so few opportunities to talk to so many people about something that is important that you actually believe there is a way through it. But normally these events are all about, let's all do it together, then we'll meet up next year and have a glass of wine. I actually think we're at a point where leadership depends on us collectively linking ourselves together so that we're not like the 10,000 people at that concert in the Ahoy in Rotterdam, and we all step forward once, and people who actually think it's okay to keep trashing the environment and be unthoughtful suddenly realize that it, there is shame involved. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah.